This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. I'm Mary Walshock, your co-host. Uh, I'm here at UCSD in the sociology department, but more importantly, the dean of university extension and associate vice chancellor for public programs. So I was delighted when Carol asked me to moderate this session because uh, our university, uh, largely through its extension program, but also through its medical school, has sought all kinds of ways to relate to its community in um, constructive and meaningful uh, activities. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about what we do. I'm going to get these three people to talk about what they do. But Carol asked me to sort of set this up a bit. And I would, I would like to share with you that I think the things that have shaped our thinking, and I've looked at the kinds of work the three of you have been involved in, so I think I'm speaking for all of us, is, is this sense that even though cities and metropolitan regions are our place, this place is connected to a global economy. This place is connected to global demographics. I asked a few of you to go out on the patio with me and look at the faces of the students who are taking final exams today. They look nervous. They look <laughs> nervous, but they also are not the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kids I went to school with in the 60s. This is a different world. And so the sorts of solutions that we have to address really have to be innovative. And I'm struck by the discussion about cross-disciplinary and interagency collaboration. We hosted in this room just last week a group of 40. The Kaufman Foundation underwrote uh, a small meeting on building uh, relationships, better relationships between industry university uh, uh, act in, in, in the industry university uh, space. And we had representatives from the National Science Foundation, National Academy of Sciences, and everyone commented what I think it was one gentleman here in the audience commented on, everyone's talking about interdisciplinary uh, activity, cross-agency work, and yet every federal agency, every university, every city, every county is organized in silos. And so this problem of, of interdisciplinary uh, solutions and of collaborative solutions goes deep into the structure of our American public sector, our intellectual lives, our public agencies. Uh, and we have to address, and I think some of you are going to share with us, the ways in which you've been able to deal with those sorts of boundaries. I think the final comment I would like to make as, as a setup is the upside of down is it represents an opportunity to do innovative things. And those of you who are fans of Clay Christensen, as I am, uh, know that too often we think of incremental change as innovation. And certainly that's what corporate America defines as innovation. We're talking about transformational changes here. And that does require uh, getting beyond the silos and really creating innovative institutional mechanisms and new kinds of partnerships. So I am just so pleased to be uh, moderating this particular panel because I think each of the examples you're about to hear represent models of how you begin that journey of doing something really innovative, truly innovative, by building new kinds of alliances and tapping into expertise from multiple uh, sources. We'll start with Chris 
who uh, comes from Cleveland and has done a lot in terms of business improvement districts, and you're going to talk about that. And then Omar, who I know of your work. I'm so glad to meet you and know a lot of people at Penn. Omar is now an independent consultant, but building on the experience of uh, connecting the University of Pennsylvania to the immediate urban community of which is, was a part. And then Terry's going to talk about rethinking land use. And Terry, just as an aside, this mesa on which we sit in uh, the 1950s was highly contested space, undeveloped space. And there were lots of people who wanted hotels and golf courses and tennis camps. And I was a girl growing up in California. It was a Boy Scout camp and hiking trails and a very narrow road. And because the city fathers didn't want to use all those, lose all the military contracts we had uh, and were convinced by a man by the name of John J. Hopkins that military contracts depended on good science and technology, the city fathers, without realizing what they did, zoned it for R&D and light industry instead of for housing and tourism. That decision, in my opinion, as much as getting a University of California and all the other things that happened subsequently, changed the shape of this region, its economic base, and its opportunities to be a global city. So land use ain't trivial. You know this better than I. So I think we're going to have a lively discussion, and you're going to start. Thank you very much, Mary. Mary, um, thank you very much. I'm Chris Ronain. I'm um, president of University Circle Incorporated, which is truly a healthcare, education, arts, and culture uh, district in Cleveland. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing. I think this is a carryover issue with respect to anchor institutions and leveraging urban revitalization. Um, and I think uh, Mary set the stage with one of the most important things we can do, which is to sort of get across the pipelines with a bit of a cross-pollination between our anchor institutions. Um, also, to develop a true framework for urban revitalization. And I think this is, and many of you uh, in your cities are a part of this, this is the real deal in terms of uh, uh, neo 21st century urban redevelopment um, for cities. Basically, you know the story. Um, our anchor institutions didn't leave us in the 1950s when uh, corporations were flying out to the edge cities post-World War II. Uh, those with the sunk investments, the hospitals and the universities, couldn't just fly from those uh, multi-million dollar investments they'd made. And 30, 40 years ago, your top civic employers, city employers, uh, that were on the list of your uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, whatever they were in your cities of the 1950s, was a wholly different list than what you see today. For us, our hospitals and our universities did not make our top 10 list. Today, our hospitals and universities are our top employers. It's a fam familiar story in your cities. For us, the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, again, weren't on the top 10 list in the 1970s and 80s. Today, they're the number one and two employers in the city of Cleveland and the number two and four employers in the state of Ohio. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what those anchor institutions mean to us, but I think the numbers essentially speak for themselves. We're the fastest growing employment district in our city because of those hospitals and universities. And uh, as a result, correlatively, we're also the fastest growing resident district in the area. So. Uh, here is a part of the upside of down in a city market that I think our city market is right side up, if you will, um, in contrast to a lot of the rest of our urban district. Um, but you know, even in this economy, we have your challenges. And I'm going to end on some challenges that uh, Carol and the team asked us to talk about, which is how to sustain this, really. But the quick metrics are, you know, again, in this economy, in a um, impoverished city like Cleveland, Ohio, which so many mid-sized Midwestern cities are, post-industrial impoverished cities, um, we're on the grow. Uh, just last week, we selected a new hotel developer here in this district. Um, we launched the board of the Cleveland Museum of Art, has launched another $150 million campaign for a second phase uh, of their new museum. Um, and um, we're building housing, whether it's low mod or um, high market rate housing. Um, I'm pulling out building permits at City Hall this spring. It's good news in this economy. Why? Well, we've already talked about a few of them. The healthcare education sectors nationally are the strongest sectors nationally, maybe alongside national security. But if you've got healthcare and you've got education, you do have a future, uh, especially in terms of its spin off opportunities. Why else? Well, we were just, you know, 
Sometimes you'd rather be lucky than good. Uh, our shovels hit the ground in our area a few months back, which you know, preceded a little bit of the downturn, and we're on the grow. The other thing is the banks are investing in anchor institution districts. Um, we found no uh, slowing up uh, of bank investments. Particularly, if I tried to build a hotel in an edge city today, it'd never happen. I build in the anchor district, I've got five banks clawing all over us to try to get uh, their investments in to our district. So again, thanks to the, to the uh, anchor institutions that we represent. Um, we are University Circle Inc., uh, essentially an amalgamation of a CDC, SIDBID, and Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've been at it for 50 years. Uh, our four fathers and mothers put together an organization called University Circle Inc. Uh, interestingly, uh, just a historical footnote, they were talking to Robert Moses, the good side of Robert Moses, who was saying, <laughs> he was saying to us, you know, buy land for the future. Uh, for your anchor institutions. They will need to grow. It was a fairly prophetic thought on Robert Moses' part. It was just corresponding with our uh, founding chair by letter. But we built a development service and advocacy corporation that leverages uh, these anchor institutions. Um, what we are uh, on the grow with, very quickly, the picture of Cleveland, Ohio, is on the uh, hospital markets. We are about a billion five in new construction permits uh, in, the, in this last three years and the next two years going forward. Um, all of our hospitals are on the grow. The Cleveland Clinic uh, has just put a three quarter of a billion dollar uh, heart center uh, in the center of our city, uh, University Hospitals, a new signature cancer center, and our Veterans Administration Hospital, which is very important to us, has made a civic commitment to consolidate its suburban facilities and put them in the center city. That, the, the real power of that is a spinoff that's happening on the tech transfer businesses that are happening, spinning out of the Cleveland Clinic Innovation Center, or uh, even our Veterans Administration Hospital is spinning off simulation centers and other things. We have three universities in the area, just again to give you a little bit of a landscape uh, of what we're about. We have our Case Western Reserve University, and we have two of our signature arts colleges, the Cleveland Institute of Art and the Cleveland Institute of Music. They all, in their own way, though, are innovation centers. The tagline here, if you can't see that, is Ed's Innovation District. It's not about the brick and mortar, per se. It's about what you can leverage in terms of what they teach and how that translates into economic development that Michael was talking about earlier. Um, how can we contribute to the job picture? So our Institute of Art is also an institute of industrial design, working in collaboration with our motor companies, our manufacturing companies, everybody else to try to teach the art all over again of industrial design. The same with the Cleveland Institute of Music. Can we leverage a city like Cleveland, home of rock and roll, and Severance Hall, Cleveland Orchestra, arguably the best orchestra in this country? Well, can we leverage this entire trajectory of musical learning from the early pre-K learning at our music school settlement just around the corner from the Institute of Music to our top end um, Severance Hall. And all of them are sort of downloading their teaching. Here's where it meets. We have uh, three signature high schools in University Circle. And the great news is this little story from our local newspaper, The Plain Dealer, says that one of these urban campuses is getting excellent ratings from the state. The basic um, um, measure is the OGT, the Ohio Graduation Test System. Where are we ranking? We're ranking above state averages. This is an urban school system that 10 years ago was only graduating in the eighth grade cohort up to 12th grade. 7% of kids stayed on track. Now we're in the excellent category of best in class, literally, on the testing. Both our um, schools of science and medicine, our schools of art and architecture, our school of the arts, now the private high schools are finding us. We just opened a new Montessori high school that's brought students from as far away as Australia and New Zealand to this district to use our areas as learning labs. So our arts and cultural institutions don't just represent today um, you know, animals in glass boxes and stale exhibitry. What they represent is how do you grow things in the Cleveland uh, urban uh, environment? How can we experiment with new glass systems to build better greenhouses? We're teaching kids new trades through our arts and cultural district. It's investing in about $3 billion in capital in this one square mile, but really what the investment is about is not, again, just brick and mortar. It's about human capital investment. It's about taking anchor institutions, this has been a common theme for this group, and leveraging a, a true premier urban district. Uh, our program success is we run this like a campaign. Anybody who works for any of the city administrations knows the pillars of why mayors get elected are based on education, safe communities, um, um, communities that are connected to jobs, and uh, we, we can sort of run through the metrics on this. Basically, um, 
immersive training with our um, young people and involving our anchor, anchor institution directors um, is proving results. The Cleveland Clinic has a hand-in-glove relationship through a program they've called now the School of Science and Medicine. They're actually developing um, a, 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 a completely new curricula system, the same an arts enriched curricula with our Cleveland School of the Arts. On neighborhood stabilization, um, we've basically done what other cities are doing. We've created mortgage assistance programs to connect to neighborhoods by employees building in neighborhoods. The census increase is 12%. We're growingly international. We've got lower foreclosure rates. Um, in the economic inclusion industry, this is basically about teaching trades to the neighborhoods around us. The paradox of place in Cleveland, Ohio, is University Circles is a wealthy, rich area, but surrounded by it, again, not a unfamiliar story to you, with poverty tracks all over us. So how do we teach people new trades? Eco-friendly industry, one example, our Cleveland Clinic is now shopping its, uh, its laundry service right out to a neighborhood laundry co-op. Um, we're doing the same now, looking at solar um, uh, co-ops for solar energy power and so on. On the community safety front, get out in the neighborhoods with a new police department that's supplemental to the police department that you have at the city. The tax base doesn't go far enough anymore. Basically, you know the story. How do you take these centers of innovation and create stable communities? But one thing I want to quickly talk about is uh, the, the sustainability of all this. We have relied on the leadership of the university heads and the hospital heads to do this. They get this. They've crossed pollinated, as Mary introduced us, across pipelines. But what happens when they are gone? What is our framework for sustainability? I guess my first thought is we do need to continue to educate, even as far up as the Obama administration, about what we are up to. What happens when you have a CEO that comes on scene who's new to this, is too busy for this, has to balance a budget? What about a CEO who says, I'm only here to participate if it benefits my organization? What if it's a CEO who just doesn't see the link? Rare is that CEO who comes along and says there's a synergy at work here. I think the issue for us is we got to build a framework that actually um, um, really institutionalizes this across the cities. So it's really working more with mayors, with governors, to incentivize the permanent sustainability of a program. Five quick ideas. These are nonprofit areas. They don't pay property taxes in large part. Pilots, payments in lieu of taxes. What if we could stream those back, like TIF districts, right back to the core center to say, if you'll pay into programs like this, we'll stream the revenues geographically back to your center. Tax credits. What if we said, we will create income tax rebates for your employees? I worked for the last mayor's administration. We gave a 50% income tax rebate to companies for five years who would locate back in a city. What if we further streamlined it to a district like the Anchor Institution Districts? What if we gave capital priority for capital infrastructure for those who created job generation zones, the Anchor Institutions? What I'm talking about here is stimulative, I guess that's the word of the yep. day, uh, targeted incentivized programs. Number three, tech and tech transfer zones. These are places where you could create stem tech monies directed right into the anchor districts and you can use the federal stimulus money for tech stimulus districts. Number four, state economic development hubs. We're working with our chancellor of education at the higher education chancellor's level to create new state recognized economic development hubs located in anchor districts. Number five, mayors, county commissioners, and governors, and the president convening roundtables of groups like this that support anchor districts. Educate, indoctrinate, incentivize, and publicly reward by publicly acknowledging those institutions that are leading in this effort. Because if we live and die with the leadership of one leader across an institution, the program just dies. I guess what I'm suggesting is long term, a framework for action that is sustainable and incentivized through programs like this. I've got the stop. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> well done. What an act to follow. <laughs> well, actually, uh, uh, you, you would uh, think that we, we coordinated our, uh, our talks, but uh, Chris uh, passed it on exactly at the right place for, for me uh, to, to pitch in. And I want to talk a little bit more uh, today about taking this conversation of anchor institutions uh, a bit further. And the premise of my talk is very similar to how Chris ended uh, his uh, piece, and that is if we all concur that the, the critical role higher education plays as a sector in this economy, then what are we doing to ensure its sustainability and what are we doing to ensure that this role is being fulfilled? 
The case has been made on how universities act in their self, uh, uh, enlightened self-interest can improve their lot and the lot of their surroundings. And I think um, uh, what Chris showed is, is a great example uh, of that and, and creates a national model for it. But let me try to underline a bit more that in these hard economic times, such a role is actually critical for the health of our cities and overall economic recovery. As manufacturing, financial, and other service industries continue to disappear from our landscape, universities provide one of the few fertile grounds to leverage economic development with the highest impact. And we heard about this issue of being impactful. There is nothing more impactful than actually uh, the investments in anchor districts as, uh, as Chris uh, suggested. It is the place where we can create jobs and nurture new ideas. The, many campuses, and of course I'm not talking about San Diego or any other uh, of the, the big campuses, but if you cross the, the landscape of, uh, of urban and suburban campuses across the country, you actually find the sterile factories of mass production of degrees. And there is, there is this opportunity that we can create these as vibrant places, bursting with ideas and bustling with commerce and art and thought and research. In helping our universities creating such a vibrant and sustainable community, we actually are ensuring the health of our cities and, and citizenry alike. This is not just, I think, in this time, a nicety, but it is a necessity. And universities must embrace their role in economic development as they do with research and education. Some Something that Georgia Tech, for example, has done about 10 years ago when they have three missions. They have education, research, and economic development as part of their core, uh, of their core mission. We, we can continue to talk about anchor institutions uh, since the time that Michael Porter did the study for actually this organization in 2002. Everybody talks about the interdependence between cities and their higher education institutions, and all of that has been discussed and promoted. And uh, there are, uh, the, fo the focus of those uh, discussions have been about the, the good examples of what happened uh, and, and what we can learn from it. And the topic kind of moved a little bit further and, uh, and more like, CEO for th cities, think tanks started to think about how to leverage those uh, organizations and how to leverage the anchor institution idea. But at the end, many are still focusing on what is the role of the leader? Is he a CEO or is she a, uh, a civic leader on, and a corporate executive on, on top of being also an academic, uh, uh, academic uh, uh, administrator? There are the discussions of what constitute an anchor institution and is it just the universities or is it the eds and meds and the museums and so on. And uh, so those discussions have been actually very productive over the past three or four years. But the fact is that these, uh, these uh, advocacies and discussions have been so successful that you rarely now come across any institution, higher education institution in the country that is not promoting itself as self, uh, as uh, uh, engaged locally, and that is in full partnership with the city and leading its economic uh, revitalization, whether it is a fact or not. Right. You actually find the great sleep right. brochure that tells you about <laughs> the two or three initiatives, and then when you dig a little bit deeper, you find that they are just one or two initiatives, and it stops there. So there is a big gap between the talk and the, the actual doing. And to be honest with you, it's a better step than we were about five years ago when the talk was not even there. So I think we, we are making progress, but the question is, how can we walk a little bit faster and do a little bit more? So beyond understanding the potential and studying the few examples between anchor institutions and their host cities, we are left wondering how to emulate these examples and how much of the success stories, as uh, Chris suggested, reflect more the unique circumstances of these institutions and their leadership. The hope seems to be that the more we talk about engagement and leveraging university economic activities, more universities will fall in place and in due time embrace this important mission and accept it. I think. Where the stakes are too high for us to actually wait for all of that to happen. Those of us, uh, and I am actually, uh, I critique uh, higher education from the inside because I was an administrator for 10 years, as Mary mentioned, at the University of Pennsylvania. We all, those of you who are on the outside of higher education need to understand how insular and slow moving higher education as a sector is. It is actually, uh, uh, if, if there is a conversation of a GM, I think we need to also think of higher education as an industry that, is, that needs a total revitalization and thinking. Just an example, still at Wharton today, and the business school of the, of the University of Pennsylvania, one of the highest regarded business schools in the country, they are still teaching derivatives and credit swaps as, as great financial <laughs> instruments. 
So it takes time. And, and the question here is, do, can we afford waiting for higher education to kind of revitalize itself? And, and our, my sense and what my premise here is, is that we as a country, we as cities cannot actually afford for them to embrace their role. We kind of need to knock on the door and, and get that, uh, that mission done. So the broader discussion here uh, needs to talk about a framework uh, that is scalable at a national level where cities, states, and the federal government foundations must step in to demand that change in an industry that resists it. Call this the higher education bailout plan. <laughs> So the goal here is to create the scalable model. Let me be a little bit more specific so that at least we can actually have some discussion about some of those ideas and actually to a great extent, Chris mentioned some of them. First, I think we need a clear definition of engagement that encompasses the full academic uh, and institutional resources of a university. Not just one initiative, not just two initiatives. We need to have it across all sectors within the institution, academic and institutionally. A, de a definition that looks at how higher education as an enterprise. Second, we need to articulate a list of programs that describe in concrete steps the list of those initiatives, whether it is housing initiatives, local employment, local research, leadership in social services and healthcare, local purchasing, similar to the, the laundry story that Chris mentioned, sustainable urban design framework, support for public education, technology transfer and job creation, support for public transit, sustainability leadership and service learning. In each one of these, there is actually actually a definable program that we can define and describe and roll out for, uh, for institutions to be, uh, to be uh, emulating. Third, which I think is extremely important, we need a national set of indicators and benchmarks that public entities, states, local governments, foundations, can use to discern the level of engagement of their institutions rather than just reading their sleek brochure and kind of feel good about, about what is being done. And, uh, and, uh, and for, for those benchmarks to also be used by the institutions themselves so that there is a sense of co constant improvement and, and progress. And finally, a set of federal, state, and city policies that incent universities to do the right thing. These incentives should find their way in the state capital and operating budget, especially with public uh, schools. Something we are doing in Ohio, working with the chancellor in Ohio State, to look at how can the state, through its operating and capital budget, reward good engagement uh, as part of its uh, funding mechanism? How can foundations work with matching funds for economic development? Ca how can we look at tuition subsidies in a way under the, the, the umbrella of uh, good engagement within institutions? Even in research, if an institution is active in a local research program, how can we get a federal, as some of you may know how research is done, there is an indirect cost recovery that is paid by the federal government for every dollar of grant uh, given to research. Maybe the local research, if you are working with local schools and working with local uh, healthcare issues, you are getting a higher indirect cost recovery than if you are doing something that is more uh, global. Yeah. How can you institute tax credit programs along the lines of new market tax credits? We are so used for cities to be looking at sports complexes and convention centers and casinos, thinking that those are going to actually uh, stimulate the economy. And the idea of uh, taking anchor districts and uh, identifying them as a place where this money can come in and through, the, uh, uh, through this idea of them being a fertile ground for investment, there is a multiplier effect and there is the highest impact. Those are some few, few examples, and I think the discussion needs to go much further. But in these difficult economic times, America cannot afford to chart a new course, leaving higher education behind. It is on university campuses that the intersection of ideas, places, and purpose happen, where a young mind is infused with this energy and creates the new next industry, or discover a new cure, or become the voice of a, new, of a generation. It is these, if this youthful and creative energy is not nurtured within our urban centers, then our recovery will not be complete. Thank you. I'm Terry Schwarz. I'm also from Cleveland. Uh, I work for the Kent State Urban Design Collaborative. And um, when Carol invited us to be part of this panel, she asked us to talk about the good, the bad, and uh, the ugly. Chris, I think, very well 
covered the good, which leaves me with the bad and ugly. <laughs> um, so um, so we'll, um, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I can just tell you sort of as framing remarks that uh, I work for the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. And uh, we're the outreach center for the college. Um, we're located in downtown Cleveland. The main campus is an hour south of the city. Uh, but because our work is about engagement with urban communities, we needed to be in the center of the city. And uh, the work I'm going to talk about today is a vacant land plan for the city of Cleveland. It's a collaborative project that we've worked on with the city of Cleveland and with Neighborhood Progress, Inc., a local nonprofit organization that is an umbrella for all the community development corporations in the city. Why are we looking at vacant land? Well, Cleveland is a place, despite its strengths, um, which has in endured dramatic, uh, dramatic losses. The city's peak population in the 1950s was over 900,000. But, um, but by the last census, we had lost approximately half of our population. Uh, population loss has a lot of implications for the city. But the, the most significant um, issue from our perspective as urban designers is um, the physical reality of population loss, which translates as large-scale urban vacancy. And that first slide, it, it shows all the vacant land within the city of Cleveland. All of that red is vacant land. It doesn't include vacant buildings, which are another approximately 12,000 to 15,000 properties. So vacancy is, a, there we go, an enormous issue in the city of Cleveland. And I'm just going to try to show you the next two. Will you advance them for me, or shall I? OK. It's important to understand in Cleveland that population loss is something that has happened but also is happening. Our population decline is ongoing, um, and it's anticipated that perhaps by the next census we'll have dipped below 400,000. Um, this is really a telling statistic because when Chris was planning director in the last mayoral um, administration, um, the population in 2000 dropped below half a million for the first time. And so the, the, the policy of the city was, we're going to build 1,500 housing units a year, yes? So we can restore the population to a half million, which you know from block grant funding reasons is a really important threshold. But despite the fact that the city has built an enormous amount of housing in places like University Circle and elsewhere around the city, uh, our population decline continues. The next two slides are also kind of part of this question um, of the challenges that we face. Uh, the city has had a lot of foreclosures. This is just from the last four years. And what we know in the city of Cleveland is that a foreclosed property that sits vacant becomes unrehabable if that's a word, in a fairly short period of time. So the red on this map will vary you know, in the near term. A lot of these will become vacant sites on the previous slide. We can do the next one. This slide was done by our colleagues at Case Western. And it shows um, all of the mortgages in the county uh, that are subprime mortgages and have an adjustable rate that's set to reset before the end of the year. These are bad mortgages that haven't gone into foreclosure yet. So we know of this field of blue that we're going to get more foreclosures. And then of the foreclosures, we're going to get more vacant sites, which is why, in a nutshell, we need to be looking at vacant land strategies. The important thing, though, to consider is that within this overall composite of decline, we have places of dramatic and dynamic growth, University Circle and others that Chris described. Uh, and then we have areas of decline. The areas of blue on this map are areas that have been declining. Dark blue, declining rapidly. Light blue, de declining slightly. Uh, red areas are areas of growth, and orange are areas of slower growth. So you can see our pattern. These two um, phenomena are intricately interwoven. And so we need to be planning for growth at the same time that we're managing decline. The vacant land strategies that I'm going to talk about today, primarily I'm going to focus on number three, but I'll just briefly touch on the first two. In the areas where we have market potential, where we have still areas of strength, we're proposing holding strategies in order to create a sense of stewardship and control in these rapidly changing places so that we can stabilize and strengthen those core areas where we know that development will come once the economy begins to recover. The second area, which I'd love to talk to you about, but I don't really have time to get into, you can get I, you know, brought copies of the report, uh, talk about ways that we can um, get an economic return out of land through uh, food production and energy generation. And then the last area that I would like to focus on today, the green infrastructure question, is something that I think we all have in common, regardless of whether we're from strong market cities or weak market cities, but that as a fundamental idea of smart growth, we need to be thinking about ways that we develop cities and redevelop cities uh, that protect and restore the urban ecosystem and accommodate development in ways that do the least amount of damage. So we can move forward. 
So just briefly, these are areas that the City Planning Commission has identified as those areas of strength uh, where for the next 20 years, these are the targeted investment zones. Those are the reds and the pinks. The areas in white um, are the big question mark, which is part of the impetus behind this work that we're doing. Uh, in the areas of strength, the holding strategies are very simple, high impact, low cost greening techniques uh, that begin to kind of create the sense of a neighborhood that is solid and stable and just waiting um, for the development opportunities to be able to take root. Uh, agriculture and energy, I won't get into. We've only really just begun in these areas. Agriculture is uh, an area um, that is beginning to show real promise for the city. Uh, energy generation is something we've just begun to experiment with. So let me just jump into this question of green infrastructure uh, before I run out of time. Um, the question of smart growth is how we can you know, protect the important parts of our cities so that we are preserving the maximum amount of ecological functioning uh, within an urban setting. Uh, this map, I guess, would qualify as part of the ugly. Um, when the city was growing in the last century at a rapid clip, we did some really not so smart things, one of which is um, we depleted our tree canopy. I don't know, for those of you, many of you I've met this morning have come from Cleveland, so you may know this, but Cleveland's nickname is the Forest City. Uh, the black line on the map is the city boundary, and you can see that the city is the place where the trees aren't, uh, and that the green areas on the outside in the suburbs, <laughs> the tree canopy remains. Um, over the years, we have truly decimated our tree canopy, and you can feel this on almost any street in the city, but it wasn't until I mapped it that people actually believed me that it was true. Um, we're interested in ways that this emerging portfolio of vacancy can be used to restore the urban tree canopy gradually. Um, these are um, altered, damaged urban soils, and so we, be, we, need, we need to begin to be, rebuild the soils first um, and support lower level vegetation so we can implement more of a natural succession strategy to ultimately bring back some of the tree canopy, not just for aesthetic reasons, but also for ecological reasons, for climate reasons, um, for um, stormwater management. Well, the next slide will show you green space. There we go. Um, the city has a nice green space network represented by the darker greens on this map, but there have been a series of plans over the last few years um, to suggest new places where green, green space and um, conservation development should occur. And so the red on the map shows the vacancy, and we're looking for ways that we can repurpose some of the vacant sites uh, to rebuild and reinforce the green network of the city. We don't have the resources to build substantial new parks, and we really don't have the population either. Um, but where vacancy begins to cluster around existing green spaces, we can grow those existing green spaces, which results in only a nominal increase in maintenance obligations. And we can also look for ways to connect our green spaces into more of a system rather than a series of isolated green islands as we have today. The flip side of that tree canopy uh, um, slide is the impervious surface slide. Um, the city is more or less paved from border to border. Uh, these are roofs, parking lots, streets, sidewalks, etc. Uh, you know, if, if you have impervious surface to this degree, and a lot of post-industrial cities are like this, uh, it is by definition um, you know, uh, a, a recipe for water quality problems. And we have significant problems with water quality uh, in the city of Cleveland and in Northeast Ohio. So we're looking for ways that we can begin to remove surplus pavement in places where we have significant population loss and lack of market demand so that we can restore opportunities for stormwater infiltration. Because the city has really remarkable natural hydrology, you just wouldn't know it um, because it's almost all underground and in culverts. Um, from the back of the room, you may not be able to make the distinction, but the blue, the very few blue areas on the map are streams and rivers that are at grade. Everything in purple is either culverted or buried. Smart growth, right? We don't build on creeks and streams. Well, uh, we did, and we see these as opportunities to begin to restore the natural hydrology. If we go to the next one, if we begin to collect those vacant parcels that align on top of hyd hydrology, so where the rivers and the vacancy intersect, we can begin to set those lands aside because they shouldn't have been built on in the first place. And this is an opportunity um, to set those things aside to protect that hydrology. We don't have the resources right now to really look at stream daylighting in any significant way. And we have a huge problem with combined sewer overflows, uh, which means that you don't want to daylight a stream because you end up daylighting sewage. You have to fix the CSO first before you can explore daylighting. But we think by at least setting aside the land on top of buried streams, we can preserve that daylighting opportunity for a future um, moment when we may have the resources. And 
in the short term, we can begin restoring surface hydrology. The, cu the culvert still runs below, but if we can keep the water at the surface moving along more natural patterns, we can begin to restore the ecology of the city. Okay, we can go to the next one. And this just shows what it might look like at the neighborhood scale. These are parcel by parcel strategies that hopefully will end up adding up to a bigger picture of, of ecological restoration at a citywide scale. If we can just go to the next. Uh, I don't have time to explain this map to you. You'll have to read the report. But my point <laughs> in it is this, that you know, one of the ways that we plan for sustainable cities is that we make land use decisions based on characteristics of the land, particularly hydrology and soil characteristics. A lot of people assume that urban soils are all alike, but they're not, and all the colors on my map illustrate that in ways I can only begin to describe. Uh, I just want to briefly tell you, though, that the orange bands that sort of swirl across the map are the headwaters areas for all those buried streams. If we protect the land at the headwaters, we save a lot of problems when we get to the bottom of the watershed. So you vegetate, you reforest at the top of the watershed, you develop at the bottom of the watershed with, a, with an appropriate riparian setback, and then you begin to get more of a sustainable hydrology, which looks like this. Um, areas where we can have low maintenance neighborhood woodlots, um, places where we can establish habitat islands and, and rain gardens at the top of the watershed will do us a lot of good in terms of water quality at the bottom. Again, we're not imposing a top-down strategy. This is not about erasing neighborhoods and implanting a new ecological vision. This is a strategy that begins to insinuate these things, to wind them into the neighborhoods, um, and to begin to you know, kind of grow a more flexible and malleable green infrastructure that wraps around vestiges of, um, of remaining neighborhoods. If we can just go on, I'm almost done. The last issue of green infrastructure that impacts a lot of cities, but it hits the industrial cities of the Midwest especially hard, which are brownfields. These are all of our known brownfields. Um, there are more than this, but these are places where things have been tested, and we know that there's a problem. So there's, th th there's a lot of stuff in the ground in Cleveland. If we can go to the next one. And it doesn't, that last slide doesn't take into account this question of lead. Cleveland has the second highest levels of lead of any major city in the country. We're right behind New Orleans. And um, you can't see the numbers, for, I'm sure, but the red areas on the map are areas where 30% or more of the children who have been tested for blood lead levels have lead poisoning, elevated blood, 30%. The worst parts of the city, not to really depress you, the worst parts of the city, elevated blood lead levels exceed 50%. So we need to begin to address these questions. I mean, it's a public health crisis. It's also an incredible economic um, challenge for the city as well in terms of treating these children, educating these children, and unfortunately incarcerating some of them when we haven't been able to treat or educate them properly. If we can go to the next. So, okay. The challenge of brownfield remediation in a shrinking city is that a lot of the funds for remediation are driven by demand. You have to have a development plan in order to get clean Ohio dollars or federal funding for ground fields remediation. Where there is no development demand, there is no funding for cleanup. And even if there were, it isn't as if we can scoop the entire city up, take it to a toxic waste dump, and then you know, bring in clean topsoil from, from the agricultural areas uh, at our periphery. It's just not physically feasible. So we're looking at ways, experimental techniques, where we can begin to introduce uh, plant-based strategies uh, and soil amendments so that we can begin both extracting some of the toxins and also creating greater separation um, between the people who inhabit these neighborhoods and the toxicity that's below their feet. And this is just a hybrid strategy to suggest the ways that stormwater management, phytoremediation, these plant-based extraction techniques, uh, and, um, and agricultural uses can be interwoven in neighborhoods. Um, ideally, because we're a design center, we're trying to figure out how to make this work um, in a way that still feels urban. It's going to be a different kind of city. You might question the urbanity of it at all when you get to the scale of this. This is a real neighborhood in Cleveland, by the way. These are actual vacant areas. But we really are looking at ways to envision um, kind of the conventional, mixed-use, dense urban areas of the city intermixed with some of the neighborhoods that have very few remaining residents. We can go to the next. Um, so just to tell you where we are is that the City Planning Commission adopted these recommendations. They should. They were our partners on the work. Um, the City of Cleveland has appropriated uh, $500,000 for the implementation of pilot projects, and our partners at Neighborhood Progress are committed to raising another half million dollars. So over the next 18 months, we'll have a million dollars altogether uh, for 100 pilot projects throughout the city to test some of the ideas represented in the plan. We don't know which will work yet. Um, we're going to establish metrics beforehand to make sure uh, that we understand which of these projects are actually creating the kinds of uh, quantifiable improvements and 
values that we are hoping to see. And once we figure out what really works, we'll need to scale it up rapidly because it, by the m vacancy map, I'm sure you can see 100 pilot projects is a drop in the bucket given the scale of what we have to work with. So the last one is just our website. I did bring some hard copies of these. If you're at all interested in the work, I encourage you to take them because they're heavy and I don't want to carry them back to Cleveland. Um, but you can also download them from our website. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it was a great presentation and, and really it made me think of a couple of things and I have a very quick question and, and mainly it has to do with this issue that uh, we can, you know, we can uh, keep talking forever about the opportunity that we, we have at hand. Right? At, at this moment of crisis, it really invites us to rethink the institutions, rethink the way we're thinking about cities and so on. But it's, it's, uh, it's only until we uh, begin to arrive to the scale that you're talking about. When we touch the ground, when all these abstractions and rhetorical discourse get to be articulated in a more intelligent way. So on one hand is that, is this uh, opportunity of really arriving to, to understanding the conflicts that these local conditions begin to, to produce and to expose them. So in my mind it was uh, uh, having to do with the power of mapping. And I wanted to yeah. just uh, to reiterate that because that has been also yeah. an issue for me as, as an architect is that we have dismissed that possibility. What you are talking about, I think, is about an intelligent way of mapping. So we're radicalizing the GIS, as I call it, because mm -hmm. it's not only about do documented vacancy, but it's about how that can produce a very intelligent way to reorganize growth. I think that forever the, the main conflict in our cities is this collision between the jurisdictional and the natural. Mm -hmm. And I think that to suggest that natural systems can be acknowledged as a way of reorganizing growth is a fundamental thing. I think there's an amazing intelligence behind what you are doing. And so uh, my question is that uh, as we speak of this possibility, at the scale of the block, of the parcel, uh, as, as a way of repurposing these vacant sites. I think there is also an opportunity to inject into that something that we continue to ignore or at times forget, and it is about the social capital, the kind of uh, intervention and, and the role that local agencies, community-based groups, churches, uh, uh, non-profit organizations, artists, collaboratives, can have in repurposing also these uh, uh, green spaces uh, as working landscapes, as, as local economies from the bottom up, uh, as, as, as interesting programming uh, efforts in terms of bicycle uh, uh, trails, uh, uh, pedestrian uh, connectivity and so on. So I think that the role of agency, which is what, what the previous speakers also spoke about, this critical interface between institutions and communities could be an added value. And I'm sure you, you've, been you, you've thought about this, but I think that uh, for me it's an important issue. Uh, mainly because I work here in San Diego with many community-based nonprofit organizations that can produce also a very different idea of economy, particularly at this time. So how can these spaces be injected or be a purpose where produce a very different idea uh, uh, of economy? That's, that's my question. I um, wholeheartedly agree with everything you said. An architect who likes GIS, this is so refreshing. <laughs> my new best friend. I work with, I mean, I work with architects and landscape architects. I'm the lone planner on the staff, and most of the time they don't understand what I do. I'm a systems designer rather than a building designer, and it makes me a bit of a freak. Um, the, where we are with this work is that the principles were developed based on technical understanding of what we know about the city and bringing in a lot of stakeholders. But now is the point where we're touching the community. Um, all of the the data that I generated as a part of this process is becoming part of a public database that's put together for us by the Trust for Public Land. It's an accessible GIS. Uh, in Cleveland, we have this phrase that comes from our friends at Case Western. They call it the demo democrat democratization of data, which yeah. means that people make better decisions when right. they know what they're doing. And so beginning um, in two weeks, actually, we have, a series of, um, <laughs> we have a series of community workshops to explain the principles of the plan. Here's how we got to this point. This is the framework for decision making. And we're going to train them in this um, online GIS. So then the community development corporations, those 100 pilot projects, are going to come from the community. And they have to tell us which of the objectives they're trying to address and help us benchmark the ways that we can tell whether they were successful or not. And we're going to choose the best and most successful projects. But we're not going to a neighborhood and saying, you get the stormwater one and you get the agriculture. We want them to come to us and say, based on your understanding of your neighborhood, what are the kinds of ways that you want to reuse your vacant land? And in some neighborhoods, the vacancy is vast. And in some, it's not. So we know that we need to be flexible and responsive at that community level. OK, Enrique, you've got the map. Well, I thought, I thought it was fascinating this uh, uh, clarity about the anchor uh, institutions in cities. 
And I think also that uh, Terry's uh, presentation uh, was uh, interesting uh, in the terms of uh, using the decline in order to reconnect in waterfronts and all this. But I must say I don't agree with this type of philosophy. I think, uh, I don't think uh, uh, that to turn the downtown areas of a city, the central areas of a, of a metropolitan area, where it's near not only to the sewage systems, uh, but to the museums, to the anchor institutions, into agricultural land. Uh, I think this is the death of a city. I think uh, when a city is losing population, we should be worrying how to make it more fun, how to make it more attractive. And it seems to me that this will be almost turning this into boring suburbs, uh, where we would not have uh, any cafes nearby, we would not see people walking in the street because we would see less and less people. I mean, the challenge is to, we must remember that human beings are part of the environment as well. And we need to make, uh, I would say, the most environmental, sustainable uh, city, the most sustainable city before anything else, is the city that is more, most fun to live in. The most fun, I mean, uh, and this is city that is more fun where we see the most people in the public spaces. We meet people, we have uh, go to the coffee shop, we go to the bread store, we go to, and uh, this is the death of a city, to, to, to turn the, this land. So I would say that even when, you, I, I thought it was fascinating at the beginning when you say that you want to reconnect the, 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 these uh, creeks and river and uh, water sheds, but I, I, would, I was thinking that the, what is missing is how to put bicycle ways of uh, wonderful pedestrian uh, spaces, and uh, not necessarily, by the way, on dirt, but on uh, hard surfaces so that people can roller skate, and that uh, you can uh, go on a bicycle. I mean, this is an environment for people. Uh, of course, I do not uh, say that it's, uh, and when you put all these water sheds, may I say, maybe it's more useful to have some uh, uh, sports fields there so you can make it more fun for people to come and play. And how do we create, I mean, how, I mean, for example, I come from a city where we have nothing resembling these fantastic waterfronts that you have, these magical waterfronts. We have just some little dumb creeks. And when I, when I say, how, how amazing to have such a fantastic lake, you know? How can a city with such an amazing treasure, this is more, worth more than all the gold and the oil in the world, how can people be living in this place? I mean, so uh, I, I, I think the challenge rather is how to get these things to uh, rebuild, how to increase the density, how to make bigger sidewalks, how to make pedestrian streets, how to make, because I really do not think that the more environmental, of course, you can have some places where you can recover your watershed and all this. I mean, uh, this, is, this is fine. I don't I disagree with some marginal work of it, but, but the real challenge is how to attract people again, how to create higher density buildings. Uh, because this is in an area where you have all the infrastructure of a city in the downtown, the, the, the pipes, the water, the streets, the public transport, the museum, the universities. And I don't think the, the great objective is to turn this into agricultural areas or, or to increase right. land. But uh, okay, if I could just clarify here. Um, yeah. You're not the first person, by the way, to accuse yeah. me of suburbanizing. And could I just remind everyone, since this is your first time at this meeting, uh, that, that those comments were from Enrique Peñalosa, who was the mayor of Bogota, Colombia. Please. You are not the first person to accuse me of suburbanizing the city. But I just want to make a point of clarification, which is our city footprint, this big, our population, this big. So, but first, we're trying to. I mean, understand that in the areas where we have economic strength, those red places on that early map are places where we are promoting with every, you know, kind of tool that we have, conventional, mixed-use, vibrant urban neighborhoods, the kinds of things that you associate with a conventional city. But you have to recognize that having lost over half of our population, the idea of making the city from border to border um, a vibrant mixed-use district is not possible. It may be possible in the future if we can manage the vacant land in ways that set up future opportunities. So what we're doing now is choosing those places for development where we're going to make the city grow as much as we can 
and then figuring out ways that we can use the surplus land, this excess that's really depleting property values across the city. It's supply and demand. Too much supply, not enough demand. So how can we repurpose some of these things, short term or long term, in order to you know, create some sort of sense of either ecological benefit or environmental uh, or economic benefit while we, while we encourage growth elsewhere in the city? So but the statistics, you know, cannot be, you know, contested at this Omar. point. Omar, <laughs> wait. I just want to, to respond because actually there is a reason why Carol thought that the discussion about anchor institutions and, uh, and vacant land use come together. And I think that strategy is a dual strategy. Mm -hmm. We need to actually, we, we, we have limited resources, whether they are federal, human capital, or, uh, or, or financial. And the idea here is that we are trying to husband those resources to create the urban centers in the most dense and in the most uh, livelihood uh, kind of uh, environment. And there is nothing more fun than being on, a, on an urban campus. I mean, we, there, is, uh, there is a reason why we believe so strongly in investments around anchor districts, because not only the anchor districts are an economic engine, but they are content driven. They are, they are full of content. They are full of art and lectures and young people with great ideas. So the, the idea of actually combining our speeches is that we cannot just try to urbanize every aspect of all of our cities. And if you go to Detroit or Phoenix, uh, they are not cities the way uh, I would, have, coming from a third world, would uh, define what a city is. Because it's miles and miles and miles of very low density uh, uh, suburban sprawl. So the notion here is that you are trying to husband those resources at the core. And that's where you create the excitement. But then there will be an issue of what do you do with the edges? What do you do with those miles of, uh, of uh, housing units that are vacant or abandoned or so on? So I think it's really a, a dual strategy rather than one solution versus the other. Well, I want to thank the panel for fabulous presentations, but also thank all of you for the lively discourse. And we're going to